This is Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We're here to help you keep your finger on the pulse. Welcome back to Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. I'm Nicole Rich. Today we are going to be discussing the topic of vascular anesthesia. I believe that as a vascular surgeon, the importance of a good relationship with my anesthesia team cannot be understated. So I have here today to join me to discuss vascular anesthesia three guests. The first is Dr. Warren Gasper, who is the Chief of Vascular Surgery at the San Francisco VA, an Assistant Professor of Vascular Surgery at UCSF, and the President of the Northern California Vascular Society. He did his general surgery residency and vascular surgery fellowship at UCSF. He is the principal investigator in multiple NIH-funded clinical trials, studying interventions for peripheral arterial disease, broadening the application of MRA imaging in vascular surgery, and treatment of paravisceral and thoracic aortic aneurysms with fenestrated endografts. He has a busy clinical practice at the VA, where he is dedicated to both the care of his patients and to the education of his trainees which is reflected in the Excellence in Teaching Awards he has received. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Gasper. Well, it's good to be here. And I have Dr. Ahmed Shalabi, who is the Chief of Vascular Anesthesia at UCSF, where he is an Associate Professor of Anesthesia and Perioperative Care. He did his residency in anesthesia at the Alexandria University Hospital in Egypt and has pursued advanced training in pediatric anesthesia at the University of Lille in France in transplantation anesthesia at UCSF, and in transesophageal echocardiography at UCLA. He discovered his passion in doing anesthesia for complex open and endovascular cases, and is a member of the Center for Aortic Excellence at UCSF, where he has developed a vascular anesthesia quality improvement database. He is a dedicated educator and mentor, and has won awards for resident teaching and mentorship. Welcome to the show, Dr. Shalabi. Thank you, Nicole. Pleasure to be here. And last but not least, I have Dr. Leanne O'Banion, who is an assistant professor of vascular surgery at UCSF Fresno, where she also completed her general surgery residency. She did her fellowship in vascular surgery at UCSF, graduated in 2017, and then returned to UCSF Fresno as an attending. She has a busy clinical practice with a focus on mentoring the next generation of vascular trainees. She is currently enrolling patients in a prospective study focused on improving the multidisciplinary system of care for patients who undergo amputations. Welcome to the show, Dr. O'Banion. Thanks for having me. In this episode, we will focus on vascular anesthesia because as trainees in vascular surgery, we are often based at large academic centers that have the kind of specialized anesthesia expertise and resources that Dr. Shalabi and his colleagues provide. Yet as young attendings, we may find ourselves at smaller hospitals without this kind of support. Therefore, I think it's important as vascular surgeons to develop our knowledge of how to negotiate the interaction with anesthesia to improve intraoperative patient care and periop outcomes. I'd like to begin by asking you, Dr. Shalabi, to comment on some of the things that make vascular anesthesia unique and distinct from, say, anesthesia for a general surgery case. Nicole, thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, focusing on vascular anesthesia requires a certain degree of knowledge and expertise of that very vulnerable patient population. The vascular patients uh, as a whole are quite oftentimes uh, have very complex medical histories. They oftentimes have previous aortic disease repairs, previous other vascular disease repairs, which would affect our anesthesia plan significantly in terms of vascular access, uh, whether venous or arterial access. Uh, so it's kind of very important for us to know what's the proposed surgical plan beforehand in order to tailor our access uh, in that regards. Uh, in addition to that, uh, other considerations of their cardiopulmonary status and their other previous histories like cerebrovascular strokes and other atherosclerotic disease complications that we need to be aware of in order to adjust our anesthetic plan for that. Thank you for summarizing that. And I wanted to know in a practical sense, when you're setting up for a vascular case, what's different about that in terms of your setup in the operating room as opposed to a, like a general surgery case? When I talk to my residents, when we're doing our preoperative evaluation, 
I always tell them you have to really focus on their patient's previous vascular history. For example, if I get a simple EVAR patient and the patient is booked for a simple infrarenal uh, endovascular aortic repair, uh, this could be a, quite a very simple anesthetic despite the patients might have very uh, complex medical history. I don't have to be very extensive. Sometimes the best solutions are the most simple ones and it can be done with just a very little monitored anesthesia care with local anesthesia. Uh, as long as I have good venous access for that in case of any need for resuscitation exists, uh, that should be quite sufficient for the procedure. But on the other hand, if I know that the patient's history beforehand, and I discuss with the vascular surgery attending beforehand, say that patient had a previous significant iliac disease and he would need an iliac conduit that will require, for example, a, a left paramedian incision to deliver the device, uh, or the patient had previous... Uh, fem distal bypasses or fem 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 bypasses and has some uh, grafts in there that might not be as a very simple percutaneous access. Uh, this could really change my anesthesia plan. So I have to dig for that to decide whether I need to do a general anesthetic or not. One of the other things in preoperative setting for the case is uh, I have to understand whether this patient had a chronic ileic occlusion. And on the reperfusion, I might be expecting significant reperfusion injuries. Uh, or if it's an open aortic repair and I'm going to be having a considerable visceral ischemia for my cervicalia cost clamp, that kind of setup also kind of entails my plan in terms of vasopressors on how to mitigate the effects of a reperfusion injury, as well as the vascular access, the venous access I need. I need to have sufficient access to give uh, significant volume uh, resuscitation of the patient, whether in terms of blood products or other fluids, uh, to mitigate such effects. Right. Those are very good points. There's a lot of vascular cases where we have a large expected EBL or we're planning to cross-clamp major arteries, uh, reperfuse major arteries that can cause major hemodynamic shifts. And so that's something that the anesthesiologist certainly needs to be prepared for. It's always very helpful where we're aware when you're doing major cross clamping uh, and which levels does make a big difference to us. If you're doing the superciliate, it's quite different to the hemodynamic changes of the cross clamping and the unclamping than an infrarenal cross clamp or just above the SMA where you still have a significant portion of the bowel preserved and as not so ischemic for a longer period of time, it definitely makes a difference on the reperfusion hemodynamic effects. And I just want to say that I think that the real value of having somebody like Dr. Shalabi in the OR with us is his understanding of what the case entails and what twists and turns there could be, you know, with the example of an EVAR. If there's been extensive lower extremity revascularizations and you know, access may not be that easy or, you know, it could considerably increase the, the risk of hemorrhage or just prolonging the case in general. I think something that um, for the young vascular surgeon going out into practice, you, you can't assume that you're going to have somebody with such an extensive knowledge of vascular surgery and understand that when you say, oh, this patient has had a previous fem fem and now we're going to go do an EVAR, that they'll understand what that actually could mean for the case, you know, that you could end up with the complication of the fem-fem and acute limb ischemia and have to do a thrombectomy and that two little IVs in the hand um, is not going to be adequate if that happens. Yeah, I totally agree. And you could get yourself into a situation like I did um, this week, actually, where, you know, if you don't really communicate with someone on the anesthesia side who may not be as experienced in vascular you might end up where the art line's on the left side and, you know, you're doing a T-bar and you're covering the left clavian, um, which is going to be suboptimal for you if things go awry and you, you need adequate blood pressure and they're having to do something in the middle of the case to try to get the art line on the right side now. So, you, you know, you can never underestimate the value of communication. And I, I think Warren makes a good point at never assuming that you've got someone like Dr. Schlobby in the OR who knows all the potential steps of the procedure and potential complications. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rabani, and thank you, Dr. Gasp, for your nice comment. I just want to add that, uh, that 
in vascular anesthesia, the, the examples are infinite and you can come up with multiple examples. And I think the best way to approach it from an anesthesia perspective is really to understand where the pathophysiology of the patient's disease is and how this could implicate our, uh, us. I, I could come up with, you know, multiple examples. Like, for example, we had a case a few months ago where a patient had some SMA stenosis, very simple angio case where we're going to put an SMA stent. And I, I, we decided to just, it's a percutaneous puncture through the femoral arteries. We decided to do just monitored anesthesia care with the patient awake. She was kind of older and more fragile. Uh, but in the middle of the case, while I was following uh, the, the intervention itself, I kind of saw that there was an interruption of the dye into the SMA and the patient started developing chest pain. So my residents said, oh, this patient may be having acute coronary syndrome. And actually the patient was basically, was having an acute bowel ischemia from the dissection into the SMA. So it's kind of very important that how we tackle it because the management is quite very different. Uh, instead of like starting, you know, getting worried and sending to opponents and getting concerned about acute aortic syndrome, it was simply that we had to assure the patient, give her some pain medication until the, the treatment of the dissection was finalized and they were able to successfully stent the, uh, the SMA. Uh, other examples, as Leanne mentioned, which is quite a very good common example, is when you're covering the left subclavian, where you're going to put your arterial lines. Or if you basically had a previous covered subclavian and you're doing a T-branch and you're going to come from the right side, your, your vascular axis would be from the right axillary artery to, to cannulate the SMA and the celiac arteries. In case if you're not using a one of those deflectible sheaths. So there are numerous examples for this. And again, I always tell my resident the previous aortic history and the previous vascular history of the patient, plus a very thorough discussion with the vascular surgeon before the case, whether the day before or even in the morning of the surgery, is invaluable in putting a very solid anesthesia plan for the patient. Yeah, I think that's one of the most important things I learned in fellowship, especially with you, is that you know we would talk about the case the night before, and so you know going out into practice where I'm in a big academic center, but the academic center for anesthesia is geared to more, more towards the CRNA students and CRNAs. I try to have that discussion with them the night before. That way they're not scrambling in the morning and saying, hey, listen, this is the case we're doing tomorrow. And, you know, we you need to know about X, Y, and Z and plan for this. And I, I think it makes for a much more calm morning when you enter in the OR and everybody's on the same page. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, th- I like that. That's a really great idea to reach out to the anesthesia team the night before, get everyone on the same page. Well, so you brought up one of the topics that was on my mind, which is, you know, when we're doing an arterial access in the upper extremity, that limits your options for intraoperative vascular access for the anesthesia team. How does that change your thinking when you're setting up for the case, Dr. Shalabi? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, T branches or high B dissections uh, when you're covering the left subclavian are a very good example of this. So again, figuring out when I have a type B dissection and you're doing a TVAR for, for treatment, covering the left subclavian is definitely an important because I will have limited options for my arterial line would be on, mainly on the right side. And that's why I always tell my residents, don't even bother by doing arterial line by palpation. You have very limited access. to Those are vascular path. They don't have healthy arteries. Uh, you only have your options uh, is a right radial or at most the right brachial. So you have to ver- be very precise by using ultrasound in that. Um, another example we had last week, actually it was a very nice case. We had a patient who was with bilateral iliac stenosis and bilateral subclavian stenosis. And uh, the vascular surgeons attempted, uh, uh, mainly for our sake, the patient had like very bad peripheral arterial disease, but he was asymptomatic from, from the upper extremity the vascular surgeon attempted to stent one of the subclavians in order to give us better arterial line blood pressure monitoring during the case. And it was unfortunately very difficult to even pass uh, a wire across the subclavian stenosis. And we decided to use just blood pressure cuff omit invasive arterial axis. And we understood that our blood pressure readings were way slower than the central uh, vertic pressures. And once they were able to do the femoral endotrectomies, we were able to get actually 
uh, central aortic readings, which were way high, were maybe 80 points different in systolic blood pressures. The blood pressure cuffs in both arms were giving like 110 systolic, but the central aortic pressures were actually kind of closer to 200, which made a lot of sense because this patient was very difficult to treat essential hypertension. And we just have to make good communication. Do we actually really need the arterial line or not for a case like this? And that patient, for example, we decided just to put a central venous axis to get our ACTs and our blood gases. And we did the case just with an epidural anesthesia, not even general, uh, to relieve the pain one side for the peripheral aortic disease. And patient had also significant COPD, so we really didn't need general anesthesia to avoid the postoperative pulmonary complication. Uh, so again, weighing the risks and benefits does make a difference. And knowing which arteries are going to be covered, which arteries are going to be accessed by the surgeon so we can look for alternatives from our side. And again, a lot of times when you're doing a vascular, especially endovascular surgery, you can do them without a, an arterial access for invasive arterial blood pressure monitoring if you have a good communication with the surgeon. And if you, sometimes we ask you kindly to uh, intermittently uh, transduce our, our arterial pressures from your arterial access from the femoral or from the brachial or from several arteries that you're asking for your endovascular procedures. That's a great point, Ahmed, that, you know, a lot of times the intraarterial monitoring is not really needed, especially if the patient's under local or a regional anesthesia. An arterial line becomes a convenient way to draw blood samples, ABGs or ACTs. But if we have access, then we can give you that. And so I think that's been another thing that I've noticed in, in practice with people who don't have much experience with vascular surgery is they have this tendency to just, it's a vascular case, place an A-line. And, you know, the, if it's something that, again, a, an AV fistula being done under local, why do you need an A-line in the other arm? And I think to the point of discussing the case ahead of time, you start to be able to anticipate these things and make everybody's life easier because this tends to be the patient who is very difficult to get arterial access. And then if that, you know, CRNA or resident is very frustrated by inability to place in radial A-line, you know, you sort of get the case off to a bad start. That's a very good point. And thank you for, for clarifying this. Uh, this is one of the main differences between the dynamics in terms of the cardiac anesthesia and the vascular anesthesia. In cardiac anesthesia, you can't really go on pump without an arterial line, maybe even two, but in vascular anesthesia, there is a lot of room with where we can say we really don't need an arterial line. And if we actually need to transduce at certain points, we can always make use of the vascular surgeon access into one of the arteries. And drawing samples for ACT is not really a very strong indication to have an arterial line. A lot of those patients have central lines for various reasons, and we can use the central lines just simply for getting our access. And the other point that a lot of, again, it's a big difference between vascular patients and the cardiac patient is that the vessels are not always straightforward to cannulate and to access. And handling uh, arterial access for monitoring from the anesthesia side should be handled quite differently from the general other cases. Um, just because of their vascular path, they never have straightforward arterial cannulations. The radial arteries are quite very small, and they're oftentimes challenging even in the most expert hand. And maybe we should stop and think for a minute, do we really need this arterial access or not? Yeah, I've gotten pretty routine um, just because we have, you know, Fresno's not the healthiest of patients. Um, we do a lot of bypasses on patients that are on dialysis, and, and dialysis often complicates things quite a bit, especially if you've had both arms accessed and multiple procedures on both arms, it can make radial art line or, or even brachial art lines somewhat complicated. And so, you know, our guys, um, our more experienced anesthesiologists have gotten pretty routine to not have an art line, even for a lower extremity bypass. Um, so I think just good communication and knowing the, like you were saying earlier, knowing the history of the patient, whether or not it's really needed is important because it's not, it's not always needed. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah, these are great examples. I know Dr. Gasper and I have done many lower extremity angiograms where we, you know, routinely hand samples up to the anesthesia team for ACTs rather than having them place an art line and it speeds the OR turnover and it's less, you know, invasive for the patient. So that's a great point. One thing I wanted to talk about 
and hear kind of your opinions on was monitored anesthesia care. You know, we use that a lot in a lot of our cases because our patients are sick and they don't necessarily need to be under general anesthesia for a lot of our procedures. And I think a lot of times monitored anesthesia care is kind of written off as like an easy anesthetic. But, you know, in fact, we're kind of asking you to keep the patient comfortable, but keep them alert enough that they can follow our commands and then also monitor their breathing and their hemodynamics. So I think there really is a fine art to that. And I was wondering if any of you could comment on it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, You know, monitored anesthesia care is a very broad spectrum. Uh, We use it uh, interchangeably with sedation. However, monitor anesthesia care is not the uh, the actual equivalent of sedation. Uh, monitor anesthesia care, if you actually literally translate it as monitor anesthesia care, so you're basically monitoring, and it does not necessarily mean you have to give the patient uh, sedation. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, hopefully, hopefully all of our <laughs> anesthesia care is monitored. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, there are a lot of patients who actually should be quite careful with their sedation. Uh, a good example of this, if you have a contained rupture of an infarina aneurysma and you think a good treatment for that would be an EVAR, this is one of the few things in endovascular anesthesia that have strong evidence, retrospective evidence behind that actually doing MAC or moderate anesthesia care for those patients have a better outcome in terms of post-operative pulmonary complication as compared to general anesthesia. However, there are several considerations to take into this. For example, those cases are not MPO, they're not prepared. Uh, they could have some irritation of the peritoneum from leakage or a continued rupture. There's, there's some sort of free blood in the peritoneum. Uh, they have full stomach. I recall several years ago with one of our colleagues that was the way a MAC for those cases, but he was wanting a deeper level of propofol, and the patients uh, vomited uh, in the middle of the procedure. Uh, so this is not only, you know, affecting your continuation of the intervention, but it also poses a, a significant risk of aspiration for the patient. I normally do those cases with pretty much no sedation or very light sedation that I make sure that the patient is alert enough, cooperative enough, and maintaining his airway reflexes in the scenario that he vomits he would be able to maintain and not, uh, his airway reflexes and cough and not aspirate and minimize the chances of aspiration. The other thing is when you're doing uh, dish to subtraction in geographies uh, and you want the patient to hold their breath, you're injecting dye, you definitely need a cooperative patient for this. You don't want the patient to be moving around and breathing continuously so you can get better images. So lighter sedation with a patient that's easily arousable yet calm and not continuously moving is quite very important. The choice of the drug, there's no one recipe that fits all. I always look at the patient and his other medical problems. For example, if I have a patient with low back pain, one good choice for sedation would be a low dose of remifentan. It's a narcotic. It will help with the back pain so the patient can lay comfortably on his back at the same time would sedate the patient. And it's a very titrable drug. So if the patient becomes over-sedated, its half-life is like a few minutes. I can basically turn it down or even turn it off, and the patient is fully awake again without any residual effects. So that should always be taken into consideration. Uh, the length of the procedure is also quite very important. So we've done cases that would go to six, seven, or even eight hours, like the case I was mentioning earlier, uh, that the patient had bilateral subclavian and bilateral uh, significant iliac stenosis and needed bilateral femoral endotrectomies. We done that with just an epidural anesthesia with just some Presidex, which is an alpha-2 agonist sedation. Presidex is a great drug, very hemodynamically stable. And what's really nice about it, it maintains the patient's airway reflexes. So we're less likely the patient will obstruct and hypoventilate and develop CO2 narcosis. So it would be very easily, once I turn down the presidex at the end of the case, the patient will wake up from the dexometamidine, and it's less likely to cause postoperative chronic dysfunction. The vascular patient population is also, most of the time, uh, on the older side, so I have to take this into consideration. I don't want to be using less drugs that will cause postoperative delirium or cognitive dysfunction, like benzodiazepines or high-dose narcotics. I should be careful when using those for my sedation. Again, as I mentioned, there's no one recipe fits all. So I have to look at the patient. 
in all his details, the length of the procedure, his other comorbidities like back pain, whether it's an elective or an emergency procedure. And what we should take into consideration, although it's not always a significant barrier, is the patient's uh, preferred language of speaking. We definitely should take it in consideration, but I don't think it should be uh, a main factor to change the anesthesia plan from a moderate anesthesia care to a general anesthesia. We've done uh, several EVARs in the past for patients who have not been speaking English at all in different languages like Russian and Japanese, and we've trained them in the preoperative area with um, licensed uh, interpreters uh, where we wrote big signs of what kind of phrases would we expecting and what kind of task we'll ask them, like holding their breath and they can re- breathe again normally in their own languages. And we would show them the signs in the preoperative area and explain the plan beforehand. Like Nicole was talking about earlier, is that when you go out into practice, you're not always going to have the perfect setup of vascular anesthesia available. And so I think just knowing what your anesthesia providers are comfortable with um, and having that discussion, because just because from a vascular standpoint, you might want the patient under sedation, you know, your, your anesthesia provider may not be comfortable with that. And so ultimately the best patient outcome is going to be what everybody's comfortable with and what they do best. And so forcing somebody to do something that they don't normally do may not be the best situation. And so sometimes putting the patient to sleep the best option if they're not comfortable with the sedation. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point, Leanne. Um, You definitely want everybody to be comfortable. But I think at the same time, you know, if you are doing a procedure under MAC and the person is not very experienced, my experience has been that those are the people who, as the patient gets deeper and deeper and more and more disinhibited, I'm realizing that the patient needs to be lightened up the anesthesia provider is thinking the opposite. And so to sort of turn around and to say, look, I'd, you know, I'd like you to lighten the patient up now and let's see what happens is often a good move. And I think the other thing to sort of Ahmed's talk about, there's no perfect recipe for these cases. I think it is very helpful to know a bit about each of these drugs to sort of know that benzos tend to really cause a lot of delirium in the vascular patient population um, dexmedetomidine, I think, is great, although there are limitations if the patient's particularly bradycardic. Um, and then, of course, propofol works very well, too, but it can have respiratory depression. And, you know, there's pros and cons to each of these. And I can't pretend to know everything about them to the level that Ahmed does, but at least to, again, be able to have the conversation before the case of saying, well, what medication were you thinking of using or you know, what was going to be the strategy here, I think goes a long way in making sure that everybody is safe and comfortable during the procedure. Well, and, and as the vascular surgeon, no one knows the patient better than you. And, and you know your patient. So, you know, if you've got a, a really just chill patient who's going to relax and they're not uptight, you know, you can do the case under just local with anesthesia just there watching the patient and they really don't need sedation sometimes, especially if it's just an angio, you know, it's a diagnostic. So communicating that too, I think can be really helpful that the patient doesn't even need to have sedation per se or or a lot of it. These are really great points. Yeah. And I think it is important as a surgeon to be a little bit more proactive in terms of planning the even the anesthetic approach with the anesthesiologist so that everybody's on the same page. And the benefit of that knowledge you have of your patient is there for the anesthesiologist as well. So can we go back to kind of the anesthetic aspects of the hemodynamic shifts that we see intraoperatively and talk about some of the things that you're doing on the other side of the drape from us, Dr. Shalabi, in terms of cardioprotection, renal protection, and spinal cord protection? Yes, of course. Uh, Doing target organ protection during the uh, vascular cases depends, of course, on what kind of vascular surgery it is, whether it's an open surgery or an endovascular surgery. It's a peripheral uh, vascular uh, surgery or it's an aortic surgery, abdominal versus thoracic, or even a hybrid arch procedure. It kind of differs. Um, So uh, for renal protection, for example, uh, if we take... uh, kidney injury, uh, if we're talking about uh, a T-branch graft uh, of a thoracoabdominal aortic repair, for example, doing those cases, there are very lengthy cases 
and uh, the the risk of a conscious induced nephropathy uh, is there and it, it could be quite significant because you use a significant amount uh, of dye in those cases uh, and i always emphasize when i have a new resident working uh, uh, during his first week in the vascular room. I know that you did big cases like oncology surgery cases, and there are those ERAS protocols where you have to restrict the fluids to prevent the bowel edema. But this is a very different dynamic uh, scenario uh, that you have to be careful. We're using a significantly large amount uh, of dye and you have to actually hydrate the kidneys. It's very important that you actually keep the kidneys wet. And crystalloids are also the key point. Mentioning that, I have to note on the PRESERVE trial that was published last year, uh, that was funded by the VA mostly and the counterpart in Australia. And basically in this trial, they compared uh, using just normal saline versus the sodium bicarbonate and acetylcysteine, and it showed no benefit of using saline or placebo versus uh, sodium bicarbonate is used cysteine. So the main idea is you just want to use crystalloids, make sure there's a good hydration and perfusion of your kidney. Uh, so that's quite very important. I see it really makes a difference when you're just running uh, a good amount of crystalloids rather than running the patient's dry and only giving them blood products as needed during the case or even colloids. In terms of open aortic surgery, it's a different scenario. Uh, although we lack a significant amount of stronger evidence on how we protect the kidney for open aortic surgery, especially when you're doing cross-clamping of the aorta above the renals or supracilia, the evidence is quite weak, I would say. Uh, yet, we know that when you're running a patient with a very low hemoglobin level, this will increase your incidence of acute tubular necrosis or acute kidney injury. When you, we know when you're running the patient hypotensive for a longer period of time, this will definitely increase the chances of having an acute kidney injury. So optimizing your hematocrit, optimizing your blood pressure during the whole case, and try to maintain good uh, systolic and mean arterial blood pressures on the reperfusion in particular is quite very important and mitigate the acidosis that happens with the reperfusion injury. All of that is important. Um, we use several drugs. We're not sure uh, which one is better than the other. I think that mannitol is actually has an upper hand in, in all of those, uh, being not only um, a diuretic, but rather as a free radical scavenger and getting rid of those bad oxygen free radicals that we have on the reperfusion injury, I think it actually has the biggest effect. Again, I'm not supporting my um, bias towards mannitol by strong evidence. Unfortunately, we, we lack newer studies and, and uh, research in that regards. But I think it's definitely one of the important drugs to use in those kind of cases. Uh, Phenoldopam, which is a D1 agonist, is also used because it has more selective renal artery dilation. Again, not very supported by very strong evidence. Um, and if the patient develop some sort of a oligaric acute kidney injury intraoperatively, we sometimes use either loop diuretics or uh, other sort of diuretics to try to help the kidney uh, start making urine. And, and the post-operative management of those cases, uh, whether they're going to need some sort of renal replacement therapy or not, will be managed in the post-operative period in the ICU. As for spinal cord protection, it's one of the very interesting areas that we also lack more recent data and guidelines about it. Unfortunately, the most recent guidelines that we have come from the uh, American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology Foundation were published in 2010. And the, the strongest evidence that they put in their guidelines were basically, if you're going to be covering a bigger segment of the thoracic aorta or doing an open thoracic abdominal repair, uh, then you need to drain CSF to decrease your cerebrospinal fluid pressure around the spinal cord and raise your mean arterial blood pressure to increase the spinal cord perfusion pressure. Uh, however, there is no good guidelines in saying how much you should be draining of CSF, what are the targets, CSF pressures you should be pushing. And this is basically the area which uh, is being explored in several ongoing studies from different centers. And I'm hoping within the next coming few years, we'll have more clear and stronger guidelines uh, for that.
And the management is not very different in terms of spinal cord protection, whether it's an open or versus an endovascular thoracic aortic repair. This is for the kidney and the spinal cord. For cardiac protection, it becomes a little bit tricky because unlike uh, the dynamics that happen in the cardiac uh, surgery rooms, where if you're running in trouble and you're having a low fixed cardiac output syndrome coming off pump, you can always go back on cardiopulmonary bypass to support your hemodynamic. In the vascular room, uh, that's not an immediate option going on ECMO or, uh, or any other sort of extracorporeal support. Uh, so you have to be careful. With open aortic surgery, that's a kind of a significant concern. And you have to keep in mind uh, the pre existing cardiac condition and the coronary artery disease condition of those patients. And that's why it's always very helpful to have a clear idea whether they're optimized uh, from a cardiac standpoint, their coronaries have been revascularized, which on itself could be helpful, but it could also be challenging for you if the patient gets a recent coronary stent and then you have to manage the dual antiplatelet perioperatively, uh, whether this is going to affect your decision to put a, a lumbar drain, for example, or a thoracic epidural for pain control, which is quite very important for many of those patients. So you have to weigh the risks and benefits of uh, doing a coronary optimization perioperatively it's definitely good to revascularize the coronaries, but again, you have to see which is more urgent, revascularize the coronaries or repair an eight centimeters uh, paravisceral aneurysm by an open approach, which could be eminently rupturing uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, on the other hand, if you revascularize the coronaries, you might not be able to do the surgeries because you have to p keep the patient on dual antiplatelets for several weeks, depending on the kind of stents you're using, whether it's a bare metal stent or a drug eluting stents. And we were, we faced this kind of challenge several times where we had even to choose, okay, let's proceed first. We're doing the aortic aneurysm repair. And this is a challenge where you really have to involve the patient in making this decision because there is no 100% safe alternative in this, but we really have to very carefully weigh the options over here. Dr. Shalabi, thank you for that summary of... Um protection for the different organs that can be affected intraoperatively by perfusion issues. And you bring up a great point about coronary stenting, and, you know, in the preoperative setting. Um, and Dr. Gasper, I was wondering if you could comment on that, because I know you have experience with patients who've had to have coronary revascularization and then go on to have, uh, you know, big vascular operations that have large EBL and perhaps get blood products intraoperative and kind of the decision making and communication that is involved in that. Yeah, well, I, I try to keep the number of those cases uh, to a minimum. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that the first thing was that the the CARP trial, which is now, you know, it's it's getting a bit older, but it does provide some useful guidance that just to first recognize that the majority of vascular patients have some degree of coronary disease. And so if you go and look for coronary disease, you're going to find it. And if you then just sort of indiscriminately uh, treat it, then as Dr. Shalabi is pointing out, the patients may end up on dual antiplatelet therapy. There would be a delay to the repair. And what the CARP trial showed was that there really was no benefit to revascularizing these patients um, before the vascular surgery, in part because if you delay the vascular surgery for long enough, you end up with some bad outcomes. And so I think at the same time, it is important to recognize that there were a number of patients who were excluded from CARP, patients with left main disease. In other words, patients who had very high risk lesions, they were actually not included. So I think you want to look to make sure that patients have a decent functional status, and you know, especially as the cases get larger and larger, and consider doing preoperative cardiology evaluations for the patients who seem, you know, that it's a high risk surgery and it's a high likelihood that they would have coronary disease. But I think that really that, you know, you then have to have a good discussion with the, um, both the cardiologist and the anesthesiologist to say, well, if we did treat this patient, what would be the outcome? You know, is this a 
large coronary artery that needs to be revascularized? Or is this a smaller branch that maybe is sort of, you know, causing a little something to show up on a stress test, but probably would not lead to a significant MI if the patient were to to have surgery? Because I think that the other concern that often comes up from the cardiologist standpoint is that the hypotension, perioperative inflammatory process, and also protamine um, all can lead to stent thrombosis. And so the last thing they want to do is to put a stent in, everything's going well until the very end of the case, or maybe post-op day one or two, and then all of a sudden the patient's having an acute MI because of a stent thrombosis and they have to urgently go back to the cath lab. So I think that there's no simple, easy answer here, but I think that at the same time, if you can do the procedure in a way that minimizes big hemodynamic shifts, big you know transfusions, then you often are more successful. I think that it's you know it's unfortunately the situation of a you know a patient with a very large aneurysm or a, even a rupture where you you just don't have a, a less invasive or sort of more hemodynamically gentle option. And in those kind of situations, I think uh, it's important that everyone in the operating room, both the anesthesia team and the surgery team are on the same page about kind of the goals of the hemodynamics and the products that are being used and the risks and benefits of those products. Yes, absolutely. And as Dr. Gaspard mentioned, uh, the point of discussing whether to give protamine during the case and instance thrombosis are definitely should be discussed very thoroughly. There should be an exact plan how we're going to manage this, whether using what kind of products as platelets uh, perioperatively as well. Um, And I think always having sort of a multidisciplinary uh, plan preoperatively involving cardiology, involving the vascular surgery, anesthesia, and uh, all stakeholders kind of really creates a solid environment to decrease the likelihood of having such complications. There was one more point I wanted to add is when when really you have limited options in making a decision like this, and uh, when the patient does have to have a, a drug diluting stent, for example, and then yet we cannot postpone his surgery for a vascular, like it's a, it's an urgent procedure, maybe it's not an emergency, but it's quite urgent. You cannot postpone it for several weeks or month. There are some smaller alternatives that still lack an evidence for use in a, in a vascular perspective, but they use it in other settings, like using like uh, perioperative antiplatelet bridging therapies, like shorter acting um, antiplatelets, like for example, Kangrelor, which is an ultra short acting P2Y12 inhibitor. So it's basically half-life is three to five minutes. And you can stop it for an hour uh, preoperatively only, and the patient will regain his his normal um, platelet function. So one way to do it is start the patient on his dual antiplatelet, for example, aspirin or Plavix, and then stop it a week beforehand, uh, put him on a, in in hospital, like in hospitalize the patient and put him on a Kangrelor infusion and just stop it like uh, an hour before the surgery, and this should be more than enough to gain the total normal platelet function. And this way, you will really shorten the period where the patient's coronary stents are not totally covered by antiplatelets for just the intraoperative time, and you can restart it as soon as you're comfortable postoperatively. And of course, the choice of the surgery itself might be affected by this, and this is uh, would be the vascular surgeon decision at the end of the day whether the patient was originally planned for an open repair and the risk of bleeding would be increased significantly and maybe maybe it was less ideal but now given the circumstances to proceed with an endovascular repair and the risk of bleeding would be less uh, of my we face situations like this where we had to alter the surgical plan. And of course, this is a, a, a surgeon decision at the end of the day. Yeah, and then sometimes you don't have an option. So, you know, if you have to do a bypass on someone that's on Plavix and otherwise they're going to lose their leg, then just communicating with anesthesia and saying, hey, look, you know, you might have to have a lower threshold to give blood or, you know, anticipate more hemodynamic shifts because of more blood loss. Um, but I think the whole theme of this whole podcast has been communication. So if we all just communicate with each other, anesthesia, cardiology, vascular, then we can usually get the patient safely through, you know, as best we can. 
All right. So, Dr. Shalabi, you mentioned that um, there are important distinctions between cardiac and vascular anesthesia um, in reference to A-line monitoring and just the kind of va diffuse vascular disease that you may see in a vascular patient as opposed to a cardiac patient. Um, and I know you've done some work in um, establishing vascular anesthesia as its own distinct specialty. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. I've been uh, over the last few years trying to develop at UCSF vascular anesthesia, our own uh, group of anesthesiologists who are dedicated and interested in of providing uh, vascular anesthesia. There is no currently formal uh, vascular anesthesia fellowship in the U.S., maybe in a couple of institutions in Canada and some in Europe, uh, but not in the U.S. But yet, uh, most of people who do vascular anesthesia have been cardiac anesthesia trained that know all the dynamics of going on pump and managing a significant blood loss, but they're not exactly familiar with the kind of more complex endovascular aortic repair, for example. Uh, and it, it develops a certain kind of expertise. And I think uh, uh, at some point down in the future, vascular anesthesia fellowship will exist. Um, and I was mentioned to you earlier in the podcast that uh, uh, I will uh, be leaving UCSF and going to the University of Massachusetts, where I'm going to be the chief of vascular anesthesia over there. And uh, they have quite a very interesting model of uh, staffing anesthesia for vascular surgery. They have a very dedicated vascular anesthesia team for all vascular cases, as well as having vascular anesthesia calls that were quite very independent from the cardiac anesthesia. Uh, calls. So if you have any acute aortic syndrome or any vascular emergency overnight, uh, definitely the in-house um, uh, anesthesia attending for general cases or for trauma could start those cases, but they would call the on-call vascular anesthesia attending and will be basically managing the patient from there forward. Um, uh, the the nicer thing that I found in the structure of vascular anesthesia staffing over there is even the most complex of the vascular anesthesia cases, like doing the arch grafts, uh, the Bolton grafts, and the T branches, they have even a sub-specialized vascular anesthesia group, like of only four or five attendings who do those cases from the whole vascular anesthesia group. Uh, with a few handful of CRNAs who only do vascular anesthesia, which I think that kind of patient population, they deserve that kind of expertise and they deserve that kind of attention. And I'm hoping in the next coming uh, several years, we'll be able to publish more national and international guidelines on staffing complex vascular cases. And by complex vascular cases, I don't only mean aortic cases. I mean by all complex vascular cases, whether they're peripheral or even carotid vascular surgeries, or even the less common ones, like, for example, mitid aortic syndrome in pediatric vascular cases, that should have a minimum degree of knowledge and expertise. And my intermediate target is to develop vascular anesthesia fellowship for nurse anesthetists and for anesthesia graduates to develop this kind of expertise to staff those patients safely uh, and to improve our rates of success in those cases. One topic that I wanted to explore with you guys a bit and ask if, you know, what is the current practice is rapid ventricular pacing for endovascular work in the aortic arch. Dr. Gasper, I don't know if you have any uh, recent cases that you've done that involve rapid ventricular pacing. Nothing this past week, but uh, certainly a number in the past couple of years. I think that the challenge with that is uh, getting the um, pacing wires in. Um, it does take a certain amount of skill. I mean, obviously, cardiologists are very experienced with it. And I think that with the um, sort of the experience with TAVR, actually, where they use that quite often, um, you know, with that sort of broadening, um, you know, it's becoming more and more um, familiar to people in terms of using the pacemaker, doing rapid ventricular pacing, you know, you are essentially making uh, their heart beat so fast that they have no blood pressure. 
if they have a lot of coronary disease, they are going to get into trouble if you do the rapid ventricular pace in an elective setting. I typically get a cardiology consult for these patients just to sort of make sure that um, there isn't any concern um, in terms of doing rapid ventricular pacing. Um, I don't know, Ahmed, do you have any thoughts about those, those kinds of cases? Yeah, those are very interesting cases, and they pose their own challenges. And uh, as you said, uh, cardiologists are becoming more and more experienced of rapid ventricular pacing. But yet, uh, w- when it comes to the vascular surgeries that need the rapid ventricular pacing, I find it they are much more uh, uh, intriguing than the, the, the TAVRs, for example. The TAVRs are oftentimes like half an hour, 45 minutes in good interventional cardiology hands. They do percutaneous punctures. There's very little bleeding. They don't do a lot of cut downs. When we do, for example, the, the type 1 hybrid arch repairs, when we do a total arch debranching, for example, by doing a carotid, carotid, carotid subclavian bypass, they're quite more significant. And then we always face the question, okay, I'm going to put some sort of a venous axis to pass the right ventricular wire, uh, but I need also good venous axis for resuscitation. Uh, what you mentioned earlier about having a coda balloon um, in the uh, IVC or even at the right atrium has definitely been published. I've never personally done it, but I think it might be a feasible alternative when we are really concerned about their coronary artery status and going into a VFib or a sustained VTAC after the rapid ventricular pacing. One point I always say to the anesthesia trainees when you put the zoo pads, make sure they're radiolucent zoo pads if you've been doing an endovascular procedure like hybrid arch repairs or whatever. So you don't want to be putting pads and then you guys start working and one on the back of the patient, and then you find this black hole in your field that you can't see beyond. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. Uh, yeah, really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this has been a really great discussion. I'm so appreciative of all of you guys joining us today. Um, anyone have any last thoughts that they want to add? Anything you feel that we've missed? Surgery is such an evolving field. And as we get more subspecialized, having the opportunity to have a subspecialty of anesthesia dedicated just to vascular is something that's really innovative. Yeah, I completely agree. We're very fortunate to have you at UCSF, Dr. Shalabi, and you'll be missed when you leave for Massachusetts. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you, Leanne, for your comments, and thank you, Warren, for this. So this has been a great opportunity, and uh, uh, I'm always there for for the vascular patients, above all, and then the vascular surgeons and vascular anesthesia, and it's uh, been a, a great journey uh, working taking care of this kind of very vulnerable patient population. And it's always a pleasure. You know, this also just uh, brings to light that the, you know, the skills that we ask, you know, a vascular anesthesiologist to have really don't fit nicely into just one bucket for other areas of anesthesia. I mean, we're talking about patients who might need rapid ventricular pacing They might need a regional anesthesia or a spinal drain. Um, And of course, then there's always the challenge of getting intra-arterial and intra-venous access. So, um, you know, I think that if you're not lucky enough to have, uh, you know, somebody really interested in vascular anesthesia, I think it it just is really important to make sure that if you have a complicated case and, and, you know, there's going to be an anesthesiologist who doesn't have particular comfort or skills in all of these areas that you sort of assemble a team to make sure that your case goes well. Thank you again to all of you for joining me today. It's been great discussing this with all of you, and uh, I'll see you on the next episode of Audible Bleeding. We are Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. Our team is committed to providing free, high-quality, unbiased content to our listeners. We currently do not take any funding from industry sponsors or advertising, and we hope to keep it that way. So if you want to help us keep bringing you great content, go to audiblebleeding.com support and find out how.